Liver Tumors and Portal Hypertension, presented by Dr. Aaron Shavinsky. Please welcome back Dr. Shavinsky. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your kind indulgence. Um, I have this lecture, and then I have one more after this, kind of a, just a hodgepodge of different surgical oncology things that I put together that really wasn't covered in any of the other talks. And I'll be around for a little bit after if anybody has any questions. So this is really divided into two sections. We have a, a talk on liver and liver tumors, liver surgery, and then we'll have a talk on portal hypertension. And I'll, uh, in, the, in, in the interest of a full disclosure, I'm not a vascular surgeon but I suspect that there aren't many surgeries being done for portal hypertension anyway. So I've kind of cobbled together what I think is the most current guideline. And, and, and really, I'm going to also talk a little bit about, which is probably more important clinically than it is probably for the exam, is how do you manage patients with um, cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease who present with common general surgical problems? And what do you do with them? And how do you deal with them? And how do you prepare them for surgery, and what are the risks? Um, because that's something that we deal with all the time. And, and you know, previous to my previous uh, place of employment wasn't at a transplant center. I am now at a center that has transplant, so it's a little bit easier. But when you're working at a place that doesn't have transplant people, it makes it a little bit more dicey. So uh, my uh, disclosures haven't changed. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy of the liver and, the, and hepatic imaging, talking about benign and malignant tumors of the liver, talking about liver surgery, liver resection, techniques and equipment, uh, talking about the different tools that one can use to go through or to treat liver tumors. We're going to talk about the metastatic disease and surgery for metastatic disease, uh, and uh, we're going to talk, end up talking a little bit about portal hypertension. So it'll be a little bit over an hour, probably not quite an hour and a half, and uh, we'll probably take a 10-minute break after this talk prior to my last one. So you have a 66-year-old male who underwent a left hemicolectomy for an adenocarcinoma of the colon two years ago, T3, N0, M0, stage 2. He received no chemotherapy. He has an elevated CEA level. And which of the following tests would be the least useful to assess his liver for the presence of metastatic disease? Helical CT, intraoperative ultrasound, PET CT, MRI, or liver spleen scan? We'll start off with an easy question. And, and the answer is liver spleen scan. Really, very little use for a liver spleen scan today, except maybe perhaps look for an accessory spleen. So, very important slide. This is the segmental anatomy of the liver that you need to know, uh, remembering that uh, the right lobe is segments 5, 6, 7, and 8. The left lobe is segment 1, 2, 3, and 4. Segment 1 being the caudate, segment 4 divided into 4A and 4B, segment 2 and 3 making up the left lateral segment of the liver. The liver anatomy, as we know, each independent segment by and large has an artery, a vein, and a duct. Uh, you have uh, the vena cava that runs posterior to the liver. You have the right, left, and middle hepatic vein. The middle hepatic vein can and often does drain into the left hepatic vein. And here is a broken down area of the liver as we can independently remove any of these segments while leaving intact the other, uh, of course, with regard to where the major vessels run. Uh, the portal vein, as we know, is formed by the splenic vein and the SMV, the IMV drains into the port, into the splenic, and then the SMV and splenic come together to form the portal, and that represents about uh, three quarters of all blood flow to the liver, about 75%. The common hepatic artery most commonly 
arises from the celiac, given the proper hepatic uh, after the gastroduodenal branches, and supplies 25% of the blood flow to the liver. The arterial supply to the liver has the greatest degree of variation of all of the uh, uh, anatomy. Uh, three hepatic veins, the middle draining into the left 80% of the time and 20% of the time directly into the IVC. And the caudate lobe having a separate portal, hepatic artery, and venous outflow. Remembering the physiology of bilirubin, the breakdown product of hemoglobin, hem, biliverdin, and bilirubin conjugating in the liver and actively secreted into the bile. Urobilinogen is reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and released in the urine. Bile is 90% water, 85% of the solids are bile salts. Primary bile acid, colic and chenodeoxycholic acid, and secondary bile salts, lithocholic and chenodeoxycholic acid, phospholipids, and cholesterol used to help break down some of the fats in our diet. So when we image the liver, the, the real backbone of all liver, liver imaging today is the helical CT which can be done with a single breath hold, which can uh, have very accurate representation with an arterial and a venous phase. CT arterial portography, I mentioned, really for historical interest, that is where they used to put in a catheter directly into the hepatic uh, circulation and do a CT scan with direct injection. That's no longer really done anymore. MRI is very hopeful for looking at tumors in the liver, probably more sensitive even than uh, CT. You can see smaller things on MRI than you can on CT, but at a greater cost. And ultrasound, external ultrasound for the liver is a relatively gross study. Intraoperative ultrasound is the most sensitive way to evaluate the liver for the presence of uh, space-occupying lesions. Liver spleen scan, relatively uh, relegated to, to historical interest. And PET-CT is important for looking at tumors, but understanding that PET-CT is not as helpful diagnostically, anatomically, as a helical CT. Uh, but it does fuse the images based on the uh, use of FDG, which is a glucose metabolite. So helical CT, 85% sensitivity, 96% positive predictive value, 3% false negatives. It's the most readily available and cost effective. Re reliably finds tumors at one centimeter. Respiratory gating, removing artifact from breathing. And this is a very important slide. You might want to cut it down and put it up on your wall because you can't find it all that often. But this is how do you turn a CT image into the segments that I mentioned before. And I find it very helpful to me to you to look at this when I'm looking at a CT and say, okay, where's the tumor? Is it in 4A? Is it in 4B? Is it in 6 or 7 or 8? And how do you look at it? So I find that very helpful. And I, you know, I have one of these in my desk that I kind of look at from time to time. And then here you see down below the cava with the left and middle and right hepatic vein. And really the determining factor about what type of resection you're going to do will often come down to what, is the, uh, what are the venous architecture look like? And is it in the right or the left? And is it over here or is it over here? And what, which of the venous segments am I going to need to sacrifice in order to remove this tumor? MRI can differentiate benign from malignant tumors. With gadolinium, can detect tumors up to half a millimeter. Its accuracy is greater than 90%. And EOVIST, for those of you who don't know about it, is a particularly important contrast agent, which is particularly looking for liver parenchyma. So if you suspect that the patient has a hepatocellular malignancy or a hepatic 
a tumor of hepatic origin, EOVIST is particularly helpful in helping to make that differentiation. And it helps to detection of HCC metastases and benign lesions. But your radiologist won't use it unless you ask them, unless they're really slick. So if you really have a, a tough lesion, you're going to ask for an EOVIST-enhanced MRI, and that will help you to differentiate uh, whether or not this is a tumor that you need to remove or one that's benign. Intraoperative ultrasound has a sensitivity and specificity of about 95% for liver lesions. It can help to look at vascular invasion, biliary invasion, determines resectability. It can change your operative plan in one study in up to 43% of the cases based on the intraoperative ultrasound, 7% less surgery, 16% more, 20% aborted surgery. This is not quite as true today because the quality of the CTs have become so much better that it's, it's less common to find uh, things that are changing your plan, except for small tumors in the two to three millimeter range, which you're just not going to see on any imaging study externally. And the intraoperative ultrasound of the liver is really the backbone of any liver surgery program. It surveys the liver, it guides biopsies, identifies ducts and vessels, it guides ablations. It can be done open or laparoscopic, and of course, uh, uh, there are now biplanar and 3D ultrasounds that you can use. You can also fuse the ultrasound with the CT scan to help uh, guide um, uh, biopsies or uh, you know, probe placement for radiofrequency ablation. So, under the ultrasound, here is your cava, your middle hepatic, right hepatic, left hepatic vein. You can see this is your portal vein. It has that typical bat wing configuration at the hilum where the portal comes together. Always has a little white stripe around it. Moving on to talking about uh, benign liver tumors and their management. Okay, so next question. A 33-year-old woman was found to have an asymptomatic 2-centimeter mass in the liver as depicted, which is hyper-intense when given contrast. What should you advise this patient? CT-guided biopsy, immediate resection, hepatic artery embolization, forget about the lesion, it's clearly benign, or stop oral contraceptives and repeat the scan in three to six months. So the answer is E. Uh, this is a hepatic adenoma most likely associated with the use of oral contraceptives. And the uh, current guideline for that would be to stop the oral contraceptive and repeat the study if the patient is not symptomatic. So benign tumors of the liver, you have cysts, hemangiomas, FNH, focal nodular hyperplasia, adenomas, and abscess. Liver cysts, most are simple, benign, and rarely symptomatic, affect about 5% of the population. They can cause pain, so the sense of abdominal fullness, increasing girth and early satiety. They can be associated with polycystic kidney disease. And large symptomatic cysts can be drained externally, but they'll often recur. Laparoscopic excision with the placement of omentum into the cyst cavity is the generally recommended current treatment alternative, uh, where you just laparoscopically marsupialize and remove the outer wall of the cyst. If there's biliary fluid in the cyst, you might also put a drain in, uh, because it may drain bile for, for a few days. Uh, cyst adenomas are premalignant. They're usually complex with mural nodules, most commonly in women in the fourth and fifth decade, and enucleation or resection is the preferred method. Echinococcus is a parasite which can cause uh, uh, abscess in the liver, echinococcal cysts. They come up on exams from time to time. The human is an intermediate host. The dog is the final host. Uh, and there are both ELISA, ELISA, and IHA hemoglutinin tests to identify them. Uh, the treatment, 
Uh, surgical removal of the cyst is 90% effective, can be risky. Remember that these cysts, if ruptured into the peritoneal cavity, can cause anaphylaxis. And they can cause parasitic cysts across the entire peritoneal cavity. So you've got to be careful not to spill them. The chemotherapy for them is albendazole, which is an anti-helminth agent. It's the preferred treatment because it penetrates into the cysts, and that's the dosage, or also mebendazole. And there's also a treatment called PAIR, P-A-I-R, puncture, aspiration, injection, and respiration, where you're injecting scolicoidal substances into the cyst. Again, trying very hard not to spill anything into the peritoneal cavity. Hemangiomas are most often benign and asymptomatic. Uh, the importance is that they're bright on T2 MR imaging with peripheral enhancement, and on CT scan you have peripheral enhancement which fills in with time. They really rarely need surgery, only if they're symptomatic or ruptured. FNH or focal nodular hyperplasia is characterized by a central scar seen on imaging. They may be difficult to differentiate from the fibrolamellar variant of hepatocellular carcinoma. And hepatic adenomas are associated with oral contraceptives. They're hyperintense on CT and MR and should be resected if they're large or symptomatic. And again, here are a couple of pictures. Here you have the hemangioma. You see you have the peripheral enhancement. Here you have the hepatic adenoma. Here you have the FNH with the typical central scar. And here you have a benign cyst. Here you have a hemangioma as well. Abscesses of the liver can be bacterial, fungal, or amoebic. 60% are from a biliary source or gallbladder. Uh, they may also be seen in inflammatory GI conditions, such as diverticular disease, appendicitis, or colon cancer. The thing about uh, colon cancer is if you have a, an abscess with strep fecium, Streptococcus fecium, that's pathognomonic of a colon cancer that's ruptured and causing a, a liver abscess. It's just a little nugget of knowledge to tuck away sometime uh, when, when you see that. Diagnosis is usually by CT. You want to treat the underlying cause with uh, culture-directed antibiotics and drain if it's a solitary or single abscess, otherwise treat systemically. Moving on to the treatment of malignant tumors. Which of the following is an absolute contraindication for resection in a patient with colorectal liver metastases? Five tumors in the right lobe, one tumor in the right lobe, one tumor in the left lobe, cirrhosis of the liver, a positive periportal lymph node, or peritoneal carcinomatosis? I will tell you that different centers have different criteria for what they will and won't do, but generally speaking, the presence of peritoneal metastasis should dissuade you from doing liver-based therapy. So the correct answer is E. Some may argue C, but C is a relative contraindication, depending on how much of the liver you need to remove, as we'll talk about. And the presence of a positive periportal node is also plus minus, depending on who you ask. So, you had your colorectal cancer lecture, I suspect, correct? Yes? Yeah. So, roughly 132,000 new cases of colorectal cancer in the U.S., roughly 50,000 deaths. One-third of all patients with colorectal cancer will have metastasis at diagnosis. Of those, 80% will have metastasis to liver at some time. 60% of all patients with colon cancer will develop MET, 80% within 24 months, 95% within 48 months. 30 to 50,000 patients with colorectal cancer hepatic metastasis per year, of which 15 to 25% will be synchronous, 20 to 30% metachronous, and 10 to 20% overall, or about 5 to 10,000 cases per year, will be candidates for local liver-based therapy of some sort. And that number is growing as the chemotherapy keeps improving. 
untreated liver metastasis, median survival five to 10 months, five-year survival three to 5%. With chemotherapy alone, you have a modest improvement. 5-FU leucovorin, full FOX, or full FIRI. Median survival 12 to 15 months from diagnosis. You add some of the newer agents, uh, bevacizumab or Avastin, which is an anti-VEGF antibody, which inhibits angiogenesis. You have a 62% response rate, median survival of about 20 months. Just remember with Avastin that it can cause bleeding, perforation, and it's irreversible. So you do not want to operate on somebody who's been on Avastin for a minimum of four to six weeks, period unless you absolutely have to, and if you have to operate, you should limit what you do and avoid the use of an anastomosis, because it will likely break down. So four to six weeks minimum off of Aston, and it's irreversible. Cetuximab or Herbitux or Panitumumab or Vectabix is an antibody to EGFR receptor. It's used in colorectal cancer patients who have KRAS wild type, which is about 70%. Those with mutant KRAS you cannot use. There's a 23% response rate in previously treated patients, 8.6% increase in survival. Zaltrap, which is a newer angiogenesis inhibitor, is used with erinthotecans, Divarga, is an oral multikinase inhibitor, which also has anti-angiogenic activity. And all of these are used in metastatic colorectal cancer. To jump a little bit over to hepatocellular carcinoma, it's the most common cancer worldwide with a million cases, roughly 35,600 cases in the US, 25,400 deaths. It's generally due to, to uh, cirrhosis from alcohol or from hepatitis. Uh, Four million people in the U.S. are HCV positive. Affects 5% of all cirrhotic patients. You can screen for the development of cancer by using alpha fetoprotein screening. You can also uh, you know, look at patients with hemochromatosis and aflatoxin exposure, but the greatest rising risk by far of the need for transplant and for the development of cirrhosis is a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH or fatty liver or the liver cirrhosis you get from being fat. And that is the greatest number of increasing cases of cirrhosis and of listing of patients for transplant in the U.S. due to the development of liver failure from NASH. Regenerative nodules from cirrhosis and HCC may be difficult to distinguish on CT and MR. HCC tends to enhance in the arterial phase and wash out in the portal vein phase, whereas regenerative nodules enhance in the portal vein phase. So, other primary liver tumors, cholangiocarcinomas and gallbladder cancers, roughly 11,000 cases in the U.S., 3,700 deaths, associated with the previous development of sclerosing cholangitis, cholidocal cysts. The risks are higher in males and in Asians, and there are uh, the, several types, mass forming, periductal infiltrating, and intraductal. The periductal infiltrating is the worst. These patients may be candidates for transplant, as are the HCC patients, and we'll go over that. At least 50% are unresectable at diagnosis, five-year survival, 40 to 60% after a margin-free resection, and the other tumors are relatively rare. So how do you determine what to do for a patient with a hepatocellular carcinoma? This is one algorithm. So the first thing is you have a patient diagnosed with an HCC, and by the way, you do not need to biopsy the patient, and you should not biopsy the patient because biopsying the patient in some centers makes them transplant ineligible. Uh, there are certain criteria, particularly the Mayo Clinic criteria, where if you biopsy it percutaneously, they are now transplant ineligible. So you want to be careful. The radiologist should be able to call this based on radiologic criteria. So. You identify an HCC. You decide, are they a resection candidate? Who are resection candidates? Non-serotic ch or child A, single lesion, no metastasis. 
Are they a transplant candidate? So this is the Milan criteria. One lesion less than five centimeters, three lesions less than three centimeters, any child's class, no gross vascular invasion, no metastases. Or are they not a transplant candidate and not a resection candidate? Comorbid factors, more than four lesions, vascular involvement, or metastatic disease. And in those patients, they go on to serafinib or sometimes an IR-based therapy like uh, TACE, transarterial chemoembolization, or something of that sort. So if they're a transplant candidate, then they get a MELD score. MELD is modeled end-stage liver disease score, which puts them on the list. But since most of these folks are not going to have bad cirrhosis and are not going to have end-stage liver failure like the others, they get extra points for having cancer. And every month they're on the list, they get even more points. And in the interim, you can go ahead and treat them with RFA or TACE or Etrium or any other type of treatment to delay them in, until they become transplant candidates. Or they can find a donor for a, for a living donor-related liver transplant where they'll split the liver and take one half of the liver from a healthy donor and go ahead and transplant that into somebody who needs a liver. But that's being done selectively at places across the country, and many of them have had uh, problems with uh, complications and deaths in the donor population. So it's not as popular as a kidney transplant. So HCC surgery holds the only cure. Five-year disease-free survival, 30 to 80 percent. Complete excision with, of localized disease. Mortality for child A patients, and we'll define what that is in a bit, 2 to 5 percent due to liver failure from underlying hepatic reserve. Resection is best. But transplant has an excellent five-year survival, 50 to 80 um, percent, and resection is only good for those with reasonable hepatic function, solitary or unilobar tumors, or those with fibrolamellar tumors which are not arising in cirrhotic patients. So we're going to move on to the talking about the, the, the actual resections. Which of the following statements is true regarding liver resection for colorectal metastasis? Lobectomy is superior to wedge excision. Lobectomy and wedge excision have similar cure rates if the margins are free. Bilobar involvement precludes resection. Repeat hepatic resection for recurrent metastases is contraindicated. Liver resection should never be done on patients over age 80. And the answer is uh, B, lobectomy and wedge excision have similar cure rates if the margins are free. So what are the common anatomical liver resections? Left hepatectomy, which is segments 2, 3, and 4. Right hepatectomy, which is segments 5, 6, 7, and 8. Extended left or extended right. Left lateral segment, segment 2 and 3. Other non-listed segmental resection and, again, non-anatomic resection or wedge excision or removal of the tumor directly. The concept of FLR is very important. FLR is future or functional liver remnant. That is the volume of liver parenchyma that remains to support the patient after resection. And there are very complicated CT-guided algorithms to calculate how much of the liver would be present and left after a particular resection. For a normal liver in a patient under the age of 70, a minimum is 20 to 30 percent healthy liver left after resection. If they have a fatty liver, uh, you need to leave at least 30 to 40 percent. If they're cirrhotic, at least 50 percent, and 50 percent for those over age 70 or those that have been treated heavily with preoperative chemotherapy, particularly erinto-tecan, uh, which can cause the blue liver syndrome, or oxaliplatin, which can cause a fatty liver. So you want to limit 
to no more than 50% resection. Portal vein embolization may allow hypertrophy of the remaining liver. When you embolize the portal vein on the side that you're going to remove, it allows the other side of the liver to compensatorily hypertrophy to kind of increase your, your odds. There's also an endocyanine green clearance test, which isn't used much anymore. In preparation for liver resection, you want to look at the protime, the albumin, and the synthetic function. You want to look at the uh, liver functions, the bilirubin, the transaminases. You want to look if they have portal hypertension, splenomegaly, low platelets, or varices. And the child pew Turcot classification for patients undergoing liver surgery, mortality risk in child A, 10%. In child B, 30%, and in child C, 80%. And we'll define what, how do you define those in a little bit. So what have we learned over the past 30 or 40 years? Well, for isolated colorectal metastases, if you resect them, you can expect a 35 to 40% uh, five-year survival. Mortality should be under 5%. Extrahepatic metastasis precludes a curative resection with an asterisk. And the asterisk is if you have an anastomotic recurrence or if you have periportal lymphadenopathy that can be resected, you know, you can get a survival, but it's going to be less. So you can get some durable long-term survival, but it's going to be a less than the 40%. Two-thirds of patients recur. Half of those will be in the liver. Uh, there is an importance to get negative margins, R0 resection. The role for neoadjuvant therapy in stage resection is still unclear. Uh, and the role of postoperative chemotherapy in patients who have resection has pretty well been solved. And most patients will receive postoperative adjuvant therapy after liver resection. What reduces survival? More than four metastases. Any metastases greater than five centimeters, a preoperative CEA level over 200. Those that present with synchronous metastases, those that have later stage disease, those that have a disease-free interval of less than 12 months, or those with extrahepatic disease. Not that these patients are not candidates for locally-based liver therapy, but that their survival rate is going to be somewhat less. Factors unrelated to survival, whether it's one or both lobes, whether you do an anatomic or a non-anatomic resection, whether you need an extended resection or a vascular resection, uh, or the age of the patient. Those do not seem to affect survival in the long term. So this is a very complex issue. And this is one that we wrestle with in my institution even to today that what do you do with somebody who presents with stage four colorectal cancer? Comes in, they're anemic, they have a right colon tumor, you scan them, they have two lesions in the right lobe of the liver. How do you manage that patient? Uh, there are many different ways of doing it, at least six that I know of. Um, you can do the colectomy first uh, as a standalone procedure. And that's appropriate if they're obstructed and they can't be stented, or they're bleeding and it can't be controlled, or they're perforated. Uh, you then do chemotherapy and then do the liver resection after that. You do the colectomy and the liver resection at the same time up front. And that's if you have a simple lesion in the liver that can just be wedged out. You do the chemotherapy first, and you do, surgery, you do no surgery up front in those patients who are not bleeding and not obstructed. And that's probably what we do with most of them. We give them chemotherapy first and then see how they do and then go in and take care of the liver and the, uh, and the colon later. There's a new rise now to doing liver first because what's going to kill patients is not the disease in their colon but their metastatic disease. So there's a move afoot to take care of the liver first, then give chemotherapy, and then go back and do the colon at a later point, if necessary, or do a simultaneous resection after chemo. And I will tell you, there is no consensus to this, but it's something to think about. Our institution 
generally speaking, we've taken the approach that in patients who aren't bleeding, aren't perforated, aren't obstructed, we'll give chemotherapy first and then assess them after their chemotherapy in three to six months and decide if we're going to do things simultaneously, we're going to do the liver first, we're going to do the colon first, or we're going to do them together. What are the keys to success in liver surgery? Don't bleed. <laughs> limit blood loss, limit shock. Um, Pre-coagulation with either a radiofrequency ablation or microwave ablation. Uh, use tools to go across the liver. Liver surgery today isn't what liver surgery was 30 years ago. There are a lot of toys to use. Many people go through the parenchyma with a stapler, which helps to limit blood loss and seal up a lot of the leaks. Um, you want to keep the CVP relatively low. You don't want a very high CVP and a very full liver. And you want to make sure that you maintain your liver volume, your future liver volume, at the appropriate level. More than 25% in everybody, certainly more than 40% in cirrhotics, those with chemotherapy, those over age 70, I would probably pop that even up to 50%. And again, like in life and in real estate, location is everything. You can do the best job you can, but this tumor sitting on the cava, splaying out the hepatic veins, there's just no resection a short of transplant that's going to take care of that. And radiofrequency ablation, with all its benefits, is not going to work well in a tumor that's surrounded by those major vessels. So just keep in mind that man planned and God laughs. You, sometimes you can help and sometimes you can't. So what's the survivability of colorectal liver metastases? Well, these are studies with patients over, over 200 patients, five-year survival, Remarkably, very similar in the mid-20s to mid-30s, 10-year survival out to the 20s. Some more, more recent studies have shown even up to 40 and 50%. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the toys that we have to deal with liver. Uh, methods to transect liver parenchyma, the monopolar cautery, ligature, the, the tissue link, which uses superheated saline, the harmonic scalpel, the CUSA, which uses ultrasound, the Irby Helix Hydrojet, which uses superheated saline, mechanical staplers, RFA, and microwave ablation. All of these can be used or can be used in combination, depending on what your facility has and how much you're willing to spend. What are the complications of liver resection? Well, the morbidity should be you know, 20, 40%, mortality under 5%, things like pleural effusion, pulmonary emboli, subphrenic abscess, bile leaks, jaundice, ascites, liver failure, etc. Next, which of the following would be appropriate for a laparoscopic approach? Drainage of a large liver cyst, removal of an isolated hepatocellular carcinoma in segment 3, Biopsy of a liver lesion at the time of a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. Removal of an isolated hepatic metastasis from colorectal cancer in segment four, or E, all of the above. And the answer is potentially all of the above. As we're moving into a more minimally invasive format, there are many people that are doing uh, laparoscopic and robotic surgery on the liver and on the pancreas as well. As we evolve the techniques, uh, there are certainly uh, cases that are appropriate for laparoscopic or even uh, robotic resection. Um, what are the indications for laparoscopic liver resection? Well, certainly benign tumors, cysts, uh, limited malignant tumors, metastatic tumors. Also, they're doing them for donor left lateral segmentectomies or right lobectomies for patients in transplant. So all of these are being currently done. 
I, I want to just uh, send a thank you to, uh, to one of my colleagues, Dave Geller at the University of Pittsburgh. The next couple of slides I borrowed from him in his lecture, uh, and he does a large volume of laparoscopic liver surgery down in Pittsburgh. He's actually a transplant trained surgeon who runs their liver surgery program now. So uh, this is uh, what he would recommend is his port placement for his uh, liver, liver resection. Here you see a patient with a tumor in the right lobe of the liver. And he has a port here, 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 and here, sort of circling the area. And here you see a patient with a tumor on the undersurface of the liver. 79-year-old with a colon metastasis. So uh, it certainly can be done. It is being done. It doesn't appear to violate any oncologic principles, nor does it seem to have any adverse effect on survivability. Talk a little bit about in situ tumor destruction, which can be done laparoscopically, open or percutaneous. Uh, for lesions that you don't or can't resect, multiple lesions close to the hilum, close to major venous or biliary structures, resection leaves too little functional reserve or if you have a close or positive margin. Patients who've had cirrhosis or have chemotherapy, poor operative risks, or undergoing a staged approach. Cryotherapy is the oldest of the technologies. Intracellular ice formation leading to cell rupture. Liquid nitrogen delivered through hollow tubes with an ice ball uh, generated, creating a one centimeter lesion bigger than the target. It can be also done through uh, deep and surface lesions. Uh, there was about a 40% recurrence in the liver of the studies done, and they're still being done in certain places across the country. Uh, indications, multiple lesions, limit, res, limited reserve. Lesions unresectable using conventional techniques because of vascular or biliary tract involvement. Close margins can also be combined with hepatic artery infusion. The complications, intraoperative hypothermia, cardiac arrhythmias, cracking the liver. Myoglobinuria, pleural effusion, abscess or cryoshock, and uh, multiple organ system failure. Not a high rate, but not insignificant. RFA or radiofrequency ablation uses radiofrequency waves converted to heat. It's the most commonly used modality for unresectable tumors. The temperatures at the tip reach up to 100 degrees Celsius. Cell death occurs at 60. These can be done open laparoscopically or percutaneously. You want to get at least a one centimeter zone of necrosis around the tumor. You monitor these under ultrasound guidance, and you can get up to a three to seven centimeter zone of necrosis based on probe size. And the uh, study of uh, RFA for colorectal metastasis, uh, you can see your survival rate, and these are about a year. Survivability about 70 to 80 percent at a year. Disease-free survival about 50 to 60 percent. Remember that with RFA, your lesion post-op on CT is always going to look worse. So you have to let your radiologist know that the lesion is going to be bigger, should be bigger, should be at least a centimeter bigger in all dimensions than the tumor that you removed. Uh, but you want to make sure that they know that so that they don't write in their report that the lesion has increased in size. And then you usually scan them about a month out and then about three months after that and you'll see it to start to contract, but sometimes it never goes away completely. If you look at survivability for unresectable hepatocellular treated with RF ablation, you have it about at 60% three-year survival. So while you're waiting for transplant, this is a viable option to treat hepatocellular carcinoma in, in when you have scarce organs. Limitations of RFA, local recurrence 20 to 30 percent. Limited RFA dimensions necessitate multiple applications. If you're near a large vessel, it acts as a heat sink, meaning as the blood supply goes through the tumor and near the tumor, you never heat up the tissue right adjacent to the vessel hot enough to get cell kill, so there is a higher recurrence rate right next to the vessel. You can also get biliary strictures if you're uh, going near a major bile duct. RFA complications, sepsis, liver failure, hemorrhage,
injury to the bile duct, burns of other organs, uh, pleural effusions, etc. But overall, major complication rate about 2%, minor complication rate about 6%, not very high. The gold standard of treatment of colorectal liver metastases is resection. For patients with unresectable disease, tumor destruction with or without resection appears to be to provide a survival advantage over chemotherapy alone, but no data exists to suggest that RFA or RFA combined with resection provides survival comparable to complete resection. And again, most of the RFA systems now are being converted over to microwave with the idea that microwave heats up more effectively and more quickly than does the RFA. So you're seeing a transition from RFA to microwave ablation in most places. Hepatic artery catheter insertion goes in and out of style. Uh, for those of you who have trained, you may have put these in. They're inserted into the gastroduodenal artery. You do a cholecystectomy and gastroduodenal artery devascularization. You load them with FUDR. You inject fluorescein to evaluate the flow in the liver. And this, the pump, which is the size of about a hockey puck, gets implanted in the soft tissue in the right lower quadrant. Um, this has shown to improve survival, at least in the only study that was done, which was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where the only proponent of this in the country, really, Dr. Kemeny, is practicing. It's useful only with disease confined to the liver. The majority of the blood flow to the tumors are arterial, and you have a dual blood supply to the liver. These are cleared by first pass, and then in the Dr. Kemeny study, the median survival was improved, two years and five year survival improved when you combined resection of liver metastasis with placement of a pump. I believe that she's still, and that's still the only institution that's doing them. Uh, on a regular basis. Complications, hepatitis, biliary sclerosis, catheter-related problems, ulcer disease, bone marrow toxicity. But the biggest one is, is you get a picture similar to sclerosing cholangitis with biliary stricture. Some of the non-surgical techniques, percutaneous ethanol injection, um, for small HCCs, poor liver function, 80% survival at one year. For both HCC and metastatic colorectal cancer, percutaneous RFA, transarterial chemoembolization or bland embolization, intraarterial chemotherapy, 50% response rate, and then radiation therapy, which can be done either external beam, cyber knife, IMRT, brachytherapy, or by the use of uh, yttrium or hot isotope beads. So this is a beta emitter. It's done by interventional radiology where they do insertion of these beads in a gel which have a yttrium 90 which are a high isotope at a very low uh, penetration rate. So it goes right into the tumor and radiates locally for about a centimeter and then they combine that with an embolization above it. Uh, and these are being done very frequently at centers across the country. Certainly uh, in our center in uh, Milwaukee, they're doing quite a lot of them. Non-colorectal metastasis, what's fair game? Really, any isolated liver lesion in a patient with good prognosis who's had good control of their primary tumor is fair game. Neuroendocrine tumors certainly are. Breast cancer, very rarely are you gonna see an isolated lesion from breast cancer which will respond to surgery. Melanomas, absolutely. Non-colorectal GI cancers, very, very unlikely. Pancreas, stomach, esophagus, very rare are you gonna see a patient who's gonna be amenable to a locally based therapy, but certainly renal cell tumors isolated to the liver, sarcomas, GIST tumors, and gynecologic cancers. If they're isolated and their primary disease is controlled, they've had a good interval of therapy, of disease-free survival, it's certainly very reasonable to go after them with a liver-based therapy. Okay, so we're gonna cover now portal hypertension. And again, I, I will reiterate, I'm not a vascular surgeon, but this is what I can glean to be the most current and best available treatment for the treatment of portal hypertension. So first, 
which treatment for variceal hemorrhage is associated with the lowest incidence of encephalopathy? TIPS, Warren shunt, portocaval shunt, mesocaval shunt, or an X fistula? So this is a favorite board question, was when I trained, still a favorite board question. The Warren shunt has the lowest incidence of encephalopathy. And we'll go forward with, the, with that. Question, the most definitive therapy for sinusoidal portal hypertension is TIPS, mesocaval shunt, portocaval shunt, Segura procedure, or liver transplant? And remember, the word, the key word here is most definitive. And the most definitive is liver transplant. Question, which of the following is true when it comes to cirrhosis and portal hypertension? Alcohol abuse is associated with sinusoidal portal hypertension. Bud Chiari is associated with pre-sinusoidal portal hypertension. Schistosomiasis is associated with post-sinusoidal portal hypertension. Most cases of pediatric portal hypertension require surgery or liver transplant should never be done in alcoholic cirrhosis. And the answer is A, alcohol abuse is associated with sinusoidal portal hypertension. We'll go over the others as we go along. So we're going to talk about anatomy, defining portal hypertension, looking at the causes, complications, evaluation, treatment, and surgery. So 80% of the blood comes to the liver from the portal vein, 20% from the hepatic artery. I know I said it was 75% in my last talk, so, you know, don't hock me, you know. It's about, it's about 80%. <laughs> uh, portal vein drains the blood from the small and the large intestine, stomach, spleen, and pancreas. The SMV and the splenic join behind the pancreas to form the portal vein, and the IMV joins the splenic vein. The uh, portal vein is the most posterior structure in the porta hepatis. Uh, and the portal vein divides into a right and left branch, the left branch receiving the umbilical vein. Uh, and here we have the anatomy again of the uh, portal. Here we see the splenic, the superior mesenteric joining to form the uh, portal. Here the inferior mesenteric comes up and joins up in there. So. The portal vein, the, the SMV drains all the intestinal veins, iliocolic, right colic, middle colic. The splenic drains the inferior mesenteric, pancreatic, gastroepiploic. And then you have the coronary vein, the cystic vein, and the paraumbilical veins. And they're important because they're going to be the collateral channels through which blood reaches the heart when the portal circulation pressure goes up and is unable to handle that uh, flow of blood. So what is portal hypertension? The elevated pressure gradient between the portal venous pressure and the IVC. The normal portal pressure is five millimeters of mercury. Portal hypertension occurs when the pressure gradient reaches eight to 12 millimeters of mercury. Eight to 10 millimeters will cause varices, more than 12 millimeters will cause variceal hemorrhage. With increasing pressure, the paraumbilical veins enlarge to form caput medusae. The coronary vein, or the left gastric vein, draining the distal esophagus enlarges to form esophageal varices also. And this can be due to increased flow or increased resistance. What are the causes of portal hypertension? 
portal or splenic thrombosis, increasing portal flow due to AVM or splenomegaly, and then you have the hepatic sources, pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post-sinusoidal or post-hepatic. So the pre-sinusoidal are things like schistosomiasis, periportal disorders, primary biliary cirrhosis, portal hypertension due to iliopathic reasons, and congenital hepatic fibrosis. Almost all cirrhosis will cause sinusoidal hyper, portal hypertension. Um, and post-sinusoidal will be things like venoocclusive disease, and post-hepatic would be things like Bud Chiari, which is out outflow obstruction, hepatic vein thrombosis, membranous obstruction of the IVC, or things in the heart that restrict flow like constrictive pericarditis or restrictive cardiomyopathy. So it's basically pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, or post-sinusoidal. And again, here we see patients with portal vein thrombosis, and we see our cirrhotic liver and a clot in the liver, in the portal vein itself. Now, portal vein thrombosis, it's important because half of all treatment, half of all children with portal hypertension have portal vein thrombosis. And in the absence of liver disease, it gets better. So you don't treat them. You don't touch them. You just leave it alone. And they'll get cavernous transformation, venous collaterals, and eventually recanalization of the vein. So no treatment is necessary for children with portal vein thrombosis in the absence of structural liver disease. Splenic vein thrombosis can cause left-sided portal hypertension or sinistral varices, frequently as a result of pancreatitis or surgery, and the treatment for that is generally splenectomy, uh, and that will take care of the problem. What are the complications of portal hypertension? Cirrhosis of the liver, varices, and the portosystemic shunts. Variceal hemorrhage is the most common. 90% of those with portal hypertension and cirrhosis develop varices. 30% of those with varices will bleed, and 30% will die during their first bleeding episode. They also develop other, other sites of uh, portosystemic communication among the veins of Retzius in the retroperitoneum, around the stomach and caput medusa, and around the rectum when you have hemorrhoids. So the answer is, in a patient with portal hypertension and cirrhosis who presents with hemorrhoidal bleeding, the answer is not do a hemorrhoidectomy, or you'll be very sorry, <laughs> or you only do it once. Other complications, ascites, congestive splenomegaly, encephalopathy, and liver failure. So, questions. Why did this patient have cirrhosis and portal hypertension? Is it due to a toxin, like alcohol? Is it due to an infection, like, uh, like hepatitis or schistosomiasis? Do they have a genetic issue? Do they have an autoimmune issue, like primary biliary cirrhosis or autoimmune hepatitis? Is it inflammatory in nature, like primary sclerosis and cholangitis? Is it idiopathic? Is it due to abnormal storage, like fat in a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis? Or iron, like in hemochromatosis or copper, like Wilson's disease? Or is it a glycogen storage problem? Or is it a congenital issue? Or is it a post-treatment issue, as in chemotherapy or post-surgical? Or is it a cardiac issue? because that's going to all impact on how you're going to treat these patients. The etiology is that cirrhosis is the end result of any one of a number of insults to the liver that cause inflammation and necrosis, fibrosis, and ultimately cirrhosis. So when it's cirrhosis, it doesn't really matter much what the etiology is because the treatment's the same, but trying to prevent it from becoming cirrhosis is important to know what is it that's causing the problem? So cirrhosis is the most common cause of portal hypertension. Chronic inflammation causes regenerative nodules separated by fibrous bands, which on a, on a, uh, on a physiologic level increases the resistance of flow through the portal vein into the liver, increasing the pressure and causing backflow and causing other 
uh, in collaterals to open up in order to handle the pressure. So these are the things you want to look at constitutionally weight loss, fatigue, changes in, in uh, weight and girth, exposures to drug and alcohol, bleeding, infections, travel, transfusions, tattoos, things like that. And do they have any congenital or hereditary liver diseases? On exam, signs of portosystemic shunt, caput medusae around the umbilicus, hemorrhoids, splenomegaly, spider angiomata, GI bleeding, uh, estimate of the functional liver reserve, and signs of liver dysfunction, ascites, jaundice, gynecomastia, testicular atrophy, palmar erythema, asterixis, which is the liver flapping, muscle wasting, fetter hepaticus, which is the breath odor that they have, encephalopathy, splenomegaly, and a firm contracted liver. And here you see a patient with caput medusae, spider angiomata, gynecomastia, and parma erythema, all associated with portal hypertension. The shunts, esophagogastric like in varices, anal rectal, cutaneous, or retroperitoneal in the veins of retzius. And here we see the typical picture of esophagogastric varices, splenic area varices, and the other areas of uh, shunting. So you want to look at their liver functions, their electrolytes, particularly their sodium, their PT, PTT, their albumin, their platelets, their alpha fetoprotein. You want to do an alpha-1 antitrypsin. You want to do a radiologic evaluation of their portal system. There, we'll see if they have splenic vein thrombosis, societies, splenomegaly, uh, and you, you want to, if, at some point, you want to know, is there any way of treating this effectively? So, diagnostically, CT scan can show ascites, collateral flow, dilation of the IVC, and CT angio prior to portosystemic shunting to identify the portal venous anatomy. Hepatic venous pressure gradient, which is a wedge pressure, measures the difference between the wedged hepatic pressure and the unoccluded hepatic pressure, sort of like doing a Swan-Gantz measurement, and then a liver biopsy, which can be done percutaneously, transjugular, or laparoscopic. And what's the treatment of portal hypertension? Medical, endoscopic, interventional radiologic, surgical, and transplant. So medical management, somatostatin reduces portal flow, uh, leads to splanchnic vasoconstriction, and can help prevent rebleeding after sclerotherapy. Vasopressin reduces splanchnic blood flow and decreases portal pressure. Nitroglycerin is the most potent splanchnic vasoconstrictor, but should not be used in the face of active bleeding. In patients who present with bleeding from portal hypertension, uh, antibiotics are important because of the risk of primary uh, peritoneal, uh, primary uh, bacterial peritonitis. And the other things are non-selective beta blockers, which reduce portal and collateral flow, reduce cardiac output, reduce re-bleeding, but is not used. Very important, you should never use beta blockers in the acute situation in patients who are bleeding from portal hypertension. That's a contraindication, only in the chronic management. So what is the management of upper GI hemorrhage? Emergency, it ceases spontaneously in 40%, 40% re-bleed within four weeks. Control the bleeding, prevent recurrence, replace the blood. Generally, the first line of therapy is endoscopy. Uh, most varices are within two centimeters of the EG junction. So, for those of you who remember the beloved sink stocking Blakemore tube or Minnesota tube, uh, the younger folks don't remember these. I remember my first night on call in the ICU in the VA where I had to put in four of these. And I called my attending and said, they're bleeding to death. And he said, yes, and hung up. <laughs> I still, I still remember that. <laughs> so uh, just for historical interest, St. Stocking, Blake Motor, Minnesota tube, uh, they have four ports. They have a balloon in the esophagus, a balloon in the stomach. 
They're temporary maneuver for massive bleeding. They should all be intubated first, insert and take an x-ray to confirm the position, inflate the gastric balloon and put it on tension, usually by either tying it to an IV bag and throwing it over a bed rail or over an IV pole or putting them in a, uh, one of those football helmets and tying it to the football helmets. I see everybody shaking their head and remembering, as I do. Um, if they still bleed, they put, inflate the esophageal balloon, but only do that for periods of 20 minutes at a time because of the risk of esophageal necrosis. But realistically today, uh, oh, these are all done uh, by our GI colleagues. They get rushed down to the uh, endoscopy lab, and, and they either get banded or they get sclerosed, and they're very effective at temporarily at least reducing the bleeding. 80% success in acutely stopping hemorrhage, although they may re-bleed at five to seven days. Um, whether they do banding or sclerotherapy, uh, they, they both work. Uh, the, the complications, fever, stricture, perforation, ulceration, mediastinitis. Tips or, tra or, a, or transportal uh, shunting is done by interventional radiology. It's for treatment of refractory uh, bleeding or refractory ascites in patients with child B or C portal hypertension, hepatogenic hydrothorax, hepatorenal syndrome, bud chiari as a bridge to transplant, and it's a shunt placed between the IVC, hepatic veins, and portal vein via transjugular approach. And my hat's off to the first interventional radiologist that tried this. I, I, I can't just imagine what he was thinking or she. But uh, it works. Bud Chiari syndrome, hepatic vein occlusion, can be due to either polycythemia, postpartum, oral contraceptives, PNH, hepatocellular carcinoma, hypercoagulable states, infections, congenital abnormalities, presents with abdominal pain, jaundice, ascites, elevated liver functions. The treatment is salt restriction, anticoagulation, TIPS, or if necessary, a liver transplant. So here's the TIPS technique. They come in through the vena cava, through the hepatic vein, pierce through into the portal vein, put a wire, dilate it, and then put a shunt in. God bless them. And here you see them actively doing it, and then finally with the shunt in place. Now, moving on to shunts. So shunts come in three categories, non-selective, selective, or partial. So non-selective or total portal systemic shunt is any shunt more than 10 millimeters between the portal vein and the IVC. Ek fistula is an end to side portal cable shunt, controlled bleeding but not ascites. Side-to-side -side cable shunt controls bleeding and ascites, but has a higher risk of encephalopathy. A, a non-selective splenorenal shunt, or TIPS. Those are the non-selective shunts. The selective shunts are the Warren shunt, which is a distosplenorenal, or the Inacucci, which is a left gastric IVC shunt, and then we'll talk a few minutes about partial shunts. So non-selective shunts, end-to-side port cable side-to-side port cable interposition, splenorenal, non-selective. Selective shunts aim to decompress varices and still, still maintain some flow to the liver. And that's really the Warren shunt. Decompresses the varices through the short gastrics into the splenic, preserves some liver function, does not relieve ascites, but has the lowest rate of encephalopathy. Non-shunting procedures include things like splenectomy for splenic vein thrombosis or sinistral portal hypertension. It can be complicated by the risk of portal vein thrombosis, and it does not treat ascites. The Segura procedure, which is gastroesophageal devascularization, devascularizes the greater curve from the pylorus to the esophagus and the upper tooth and the upper two-thirds of the lesser curvature and at least seven centimeters of the esophagus. There's also procedures of esophageal transection with an EEA, where you put the EEA through the stomach into the GE junction and transect it and reanastomose it.
They have low risk of encephalopathy, and they maintain portal flow. And then finally, liver transplantation, which is the most definitive treatment, relieves portal hypertension, prevents bleeding, controls ascites, and reverses encephalopathy. But there's a limited number of organs. The selection criteria are stringent. The patients must be substance-free. And then there's the issue of cadaveric versus living donor. So this is the child's pew classification that we talked about, child pew Turcotte. Looks at five factors, bilirubin, albumin, INR, ascites, and encephalopathy. And it gives you an A, B, or C. So child's A, 100% one year, 85% two year survival, child B, 81% and 57, child C, 45 and 35, so the, the recommendation for child A, either observe or shunt, child B, shunt or tips, child C, tips or transplant. And this is the, the, the best information that I could uh, glean. Next question, which of the following are included in the MELD score, model for end-stage liver disease, creatinine, bilirubin, protime, INR, all of the above or none of the above? And the answer is all of the above. So the MELD score uh, looks at the, the bilirubin and the INR and the creatinine. And if you look at the bottom, the 90-day mortality based on the MELD score uh, goes from less from 7% up to 87%. Uh, and this looks at how scarce organs are apportioned because the MELD score determines what place you hold on the liver transplant list. As I mentioned before, patients with cancer get extra points, and they get progressively higher numbers of points every month they're on the list, because otherwise they would never get an organ. And here you look at mortality, three-month mortality, MELD and a child Pew Turcot, three-month mortality, 40% here, 50-70%. What are the risk factors in patients in cirrhosis who undergo surgery? Anemia, ascites, child class, encephalopathy. Types of surgeries include cardiac, emergency, liver, and abdominal surgery. So this is a, a complicated slide, but it looks at what percent of people died based on whether they had portal hypertension depending on the type of surgery. And you can see things like peptic ulcer surgery for bleeding, 50% mortality, small bowel, 67% mortality, colon surgery, 41% mortality uh, in patients with portal hypertension, established portal hypertension, who underwent uh, various surgical procedures. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions, and we'll take a 10-minute break. Thank you. Correct, and, they, and that does they correct it. The question is, does the procedure like TACE or RFA uh, preclude you from transplant? The answer is no, it does not. But biopsy, for some reason, does. Not all centers, but some centers. <laughs> 